you doing? There probably isn't a more loyal fan base for a horror film than Texas Chainsaw. This was hard work in the hot sun, long days. It takes its toll on you. It just was a very raw, carnal kind of experience. You guys are sick. You guys are sick. Don't you have any conscience? Where I think it came from is 1973. There were a bunch of hippies hanging out right smack dab in the middle of Texas. You know, really, there were two sides. There were the hippies and there were the rednecks. In our mind, the whole world was divided up into those two. There's them that laughs and knows better. We were convinced that if we were traveling from one city to another, if our car broke down, that would be the last thing anybody would see of us. 100 years before, everything in a small town would have been considered pure, and everything in the city would be corrupt. It's the Hansel and Gretel story of where they're led deeper and deeper into the woods and then they're baked. <laughs> Only in this case, they're barbecued. I got some good barbecue here. Toby Hooper was the director of the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre and he co-wrote it with another guy named Kim Hinkle. He had shot quite a few industrial films himself. He had done one feature film, a film called Eggshells. He was in a department store one day, waiting in a long line during a Christmas shopping rush, and was going insane, being caught up in this mass of humanity, and was wound up standing next to a bunch of chainsaws that were on sale, and had this fantasy of, boy, wouldn't it be great if I could just mow all these people down and get to the line faster, and suddenly thought, wow, there's an idea for a horror film. Toby rang me up and said, listen, I've got this film I'm doing. I really want a Texan to shoot this for me, and, uh, I reckon you're the best cameraman in the state of Texas. So he, he sent me the script, I read it, it was incredible. I mean, the hair stood up on the back of my neck. I had hairs then. The film was originally undertaken with a projected $80,000 budget. It blows your mind finding how they did so much with so little. It looks like it's shot with a documentary camera. Toby has said that he wanted to shoot this handheld cinema verite. He wanted a shooting style that could be fluid like that. It could get in tight places and you know, have that organic feeling to it. There are images in there that are just so real and raw. It's almost like a snuff film. You feel this is really happening and these people are really dying. <laughs> The advertising campaign was so lurid, indicating that this was something that really happened. The original Texas Chainsaw Massacre was inspired by the life of Ed Gein, a serial killer in Wisconsin. A guy with a wide range of very unsavory interests. You know, he was a grave robber, a necrophiliac. The whole idea of making a mask out of somebody else's face clearly inspired Silence of the Lambs and Psycho alike, and ultimately the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> This film is positively ruthless in its attempt to drive you right out of your mind. It was relentless and absolutely unapologetic. This is the movie Rex Reed called the most horrifying motion picture I have ever seen. Just people screaming and running away from this guy wielding a chainsaw. You're watching it, you're thinking, oh my god, I might be in the hands of a madman. <laughs> It was really disturbing, and I mean that in a good way. It was so effective and completely freaking people out. Ooh, I just don't want to look. There's a certain reverence that goes with it. Death is not just a big joke. It finds its roots in reality, which is always the biggest horror of all. After you stop screaming, you'll start talking about it. They made a distribution deal with Bryanston. Bryanston was a distribution company that was pretty big in terms of low budget films. Whose previous successes had been uh, quite eye-opening as well. They had Deep Throat, the Warhol's Frankenstein. These fellas knew their business and knew how to collect what was owed them. Bryanston gave us a quarter of a million dollars cash up front. Oh my God, this film thing, it works. This hadn't even hit the screen yet. We're in the black. Texas Chainsaw Massacre may be the most successful independent film in history. Nobody will ever know exactly how much money it made because most of the money was siphoned off by the mafia guys who owned Bryanston Pictures. Some of the executives were Italian, some were deported. If we transpose those 1974 dollars, that would make it a number one film even today. 25 years later, members of Congress were still using the Texas Chainsaw Massacre as an example of the depravity of America. I just can't take no pleasure in killing. If they were going to say, this is what's wrong with America, they would say, films like that Texas Chainsaw Massacre.
I've heard all the rumors about the remake, and it, oh boy. I'm not looking forward to it. How do you remake a movie that like has so much history behind it, so, such a fan base? Will it stand up to you know the original? It will be so right the way it is. No, I don't know why they should, you know, like, why? I'm sure it's going to suck. I'm sorry. Yeah. A location is the Hewitt residence um, on Route 17. It's where victim one was found. When we decided to make this movie, we were determined not to make a campy horror film. I felt it was time to go back to the old school horror movie, and that means raw and real, and not a single joke. The goal of the company was to do small movies where the movie would be the star. Michael is known for making movies at a much higher budget level, and the idea behind Platinum Dunes was to make movies under the $20 million budget range, keeping them high concept and commercial, just not spending $100 million on them. I started from music videos where I had no money. So I'm used to that guerrilla filmmaking technique, and I know it can be done. So we started looking into different films, and, and the rights to Texas Chainsaw Massacre became available. Mike Fleiss is a reality producer. Six or seven years ago, he started building up his relationship with Kim Hinkle and Toby Hooper and convinced them that he was the guy to remake the movie. When I told him about the company, he said, well, take it to those guys, see what they think about it. And suddenly, this little $3 million movie became a much bigger movie. Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a title that is now revered as a classic. And what I kept finding is everyone thought this was true. This was the hook. The hook was, we're going to make this a true story. For 30 years, the files collected dust. When we started looking for writers for this film, it was important to us that we found a writer who had the respect for the original and still had a fresh enough take. So we met with the writer, Scott Kozar. He has a very twisted mind. One of the initial ideas I had was, you know, regarding the hitchhiker scene. They take the head and they boil it, except for the tongue. There was no way to improve upon the hitchhiker in the first movie because you just can't cast that, <laughs> you know? It was done the first time, and I just knew you couldn't try to replicate that. Hey, are you okay? So I came up with a different scenario. You're all gonna die. Grab, grab it! Oh. It's always, how do you get the kids in the town? That's the problem with all these horror movies. What is the reason why? I just thought it would really be dramatic if these five kids are crossing the panhandle and 10 minutes into the movie, they've got this headless corpse in the back of the van. And what are they going to do about it? Well, I'll tell you this much. There's no possible way I'm ever getting back in that van. I had this crazy idea to record a girl in a house. Totally black, big movie theater, amazing STDS sound. You hear her running around the theater clamoring up these wood stairs. She comes to the front of the screen. You can't see anything. She opens like this closet door and you hear her barricading herself and dragging stuff in front of the door. And then you hear male footsteps. And you hear her breathing, trying to be quiet, as you hear these footsteps come up and around the theater. And then you hear this guy right in front of the door. And then there's four seconds of just dead silence. Everyone in the audience would jump and then they would laugh because they got scared. How did I get scared from just hearing sound? That's when we showed it around. We showed it at AFM. We sold the movie internationally. Then we met domestic studios out here. We're going to let you listen to this. Then we had bidders and we sold the movie that day. We sold the movie before there was a script, before a page was written. It's one of those rare days where you're in profit in a movie before you've ever written a page. We sold it to New Line. We always felt that New Line was the perfect company to release this movie because they are the best company out there for horror movies. We've always talked about New Line as being a manufacturer, if you will, of, of date movies. Couples go to the movies, everybody gets scared, the girl grabs the guy, the guy grabs the girl maybe for slightly different reasons. It's something that gets you to go back. Bob Shea was one of the original distributors after the porno maven distributed the movie. This was one of our birthrights in a euphemistic sense. I felt a little bit uh, that kind of like weird synchronicity. I always knew that I wanted to make my first movie with New Line and somehow it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. I know that this movie could not have been done at just any studio. And action. There's always a rumor that Michael was going to direct this movie and I wanted to spell that because Michael never was going to direct this movie. There were rumors that I considered directing it myself. No, I, I didn't. There were scenes I would have liked to direct. 
the concept of the company was always to find interesting directors who have a great sense of style who have not done a movie before. Which would always lead us into the world of commercial video directors. We spent months looking at director's reels. An agent from CA called up and said Marcus Nispel would be interested. And I'm like, he's great. Um, I, I know Marcus. We should have him in. When we saw his reel, it was unbelievable. I mean, the reel truly was heads and tails above everything else that we had seen. I started working in advertising agencies when I was 15. Then I came to America on a Fulbright scholarship. I wanted to get more into film, winded up for a company that advertised movies. That's how I got into that world. The first step was the music videos. The best way to sort of break into directing is doing music videos. Not only is it sort of an easy place to crack, but it's also a great place to grow and to experiment. I did 250 different ones, you know, anything from Puff Daddy to Aretha Franklin to Tony Bennett. Advertising started to borrow a lot from music videos. So I did music videos that wanted to look like movies and I did commercials that wanted to look like music videos. So the big question was always, what would be my first movie like? He came in and really blew us away by making a presentation which comprised of a thousand photographs and told us how the movie was going to look and what it was going to feel like in the way that we had been describing it amongst ourselves. If I look at the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, those movies have been done. You can't do them in the same way again. You know audiences think they know what will happen and then you surprise them by not doing that. I think that is the only reason to make a remake. Michael from the get-go said this is the guy who's going to make this movie so much more. Like Jerry Bruckheimer, who found Michael Bay when he was relatively unknown and gave him a chance. That's what Michael Bay is doing with Marcus. It was my desire to create a company to help younger directors break into feature films. Commercial directors, sometimes there's this, the ad agency against the director. There's a big difference when you go to the feature world. It is a teamwork to get that movie made and to make it good. And I was trying to feed all my information that I learned in my movies to him. So that's a Michael Bay. We're talking about a fusion of different industries of different styles of filmmaking. Michael actually pioneered this whole idea of taking the best of both worlds and sort of like juggling it all. There's some areas where I just knew he would understand the merit of working with people that I work with every day that I have wireless communication with. I should go tighter on mine. You have a tighter lens? Yeah. Zoom, zoom in on that camera, please. The cinematographer is Daniel Pearl. He TP'd the original one. This is of sorts a homecoming. He's also a really good friend of mine. It turned out that Daniel was Marcus's main DP in his commercial video world. Pretty much any commercial or music video that I have on my reel, he shot. Marcus called me up. He goes, listen, Daniel, I just signed to do the remake of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Will you do it with me? And without even thinking, I immediately said yes. All the bloodying and all the fencing and all the breaking through chain link. I'm not going to do that tomorrow. Ah. I love working with him, man. He's a great friend of mine. So I sort of just said yes, then I went, well, wait a second, what did I just do? And I hung up the phone, I said, I always told everybody I wouldn't do this film again. And without even a moment's hesitation, I said yes. So it's a fascination that I have with him. He's just an incredible man to work with. The films just always come out good. I thought it was very important, and I think it's somehow expected by the diehard fans to somehow, you know, kiss a ring. John LaRoquette, thank God, worked out. He did the narration of the first one. He did the narration here. Every time we got someone else to try to do it, it just didn't sound like John Larroquette. The events of that day were to lead to the discovery of one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The one single aspect that I'm the most proud of is the cast. We were looking for great actors, but we were also looking for compatibility. They got to look believable that they're all going from one place to the other, that they would be in this van together, and that they had a really good chemistry. It's like synchronicity. When we read the script, Scott Kozar had given a nice description to each character. I remember when he was describing Aaron, he said, she'd be Miss Texas if she wasn't such a tomboy. Big brothers. Well, Jessica basically grew up on television. She was on the show Seventh Heaven for seven years, so America basically watched her grow up. This is clearly such a departure. I can see why she would want to make this type of a movie, because you just have to break the spell of being a child actor. Action! Please, you've got to help him! This is fucking killing him! I love horror films. I've been interested in the genre ever since I was a kid. I love being scared and freaked out. Ah! 
I loved the script, and I was so excited to hear that Michael Bay was going to be a part of it, and also Marcus. Good. You know what? It was too much of a shock moment when you turned around. Go right away again. I had no doubt in my mind. I really wanted to be part of this movie. Okay, Morgan. Come on. Morgan, get up. You have a very strong, very, very intelligent woman that goes deep in her female energy, and every woman likes to see a woman that's a survivor, that's a hero, that is smart does something about it. Interesting enough, when they saw the movie, New Line said, man, women aren't going to like this movie. And it was surprising that women went in droves to this movie. We were looking for the part of Kemper. He can't be just a polite guy or just a nice guy. You got to be a little bit of a shit. Kem, can you do something about the AC back here? I'm melting. No. My wife was a huge Six Feet Under fan. She kept on pointing on Eric. And I went like, damn, he, he would be really good on what an edge. Keep your goddamn voice down. He always wanted to be in a horror movie that everyone was terrified of, so it's like kind of a dream come true. All right, that's it. If somebody's out there, just stop fucking around, all right? When he did audition, he had this sense of authority and leadership when he came in. Do you understand that we cannot drive around this town with a dead woman in the back of our van? The guy was fantastic. He's like the kind of guy you want to have at any dinner party you ever throw that just loosens things up. Regrettably, against popular belief, was the first one to get whacked in the head. He gets killed 20 minutes into the movie, but you don't think so because he comes in and he takes such command of the situation. The last thing you think is that that's going to be the first guy to go, and that's why he was the perfect guy to cast for the role. Jonathan Tucker plays Morgan. Morgan is the intellectual of the group. 33,000 Americans each day are infected with a sexually transmitted disease, and two-thirds of them are just about your age. He has the unfortunate task of really knowing more than the other characters of what's going on. I think we should go, like now, like right now. Jonathan Tucker is a guy who's been acting since he was a kid. He was in The Virgin Suicide. He did a movie called The Deep End. He's a very seasoned movie actor. A girl blew her head off in our car today. We lost um, our weed. Uh, you know, we're dicking around this. Pull on, go down. What I like that the stakes are really high. I've never played anything like this where your life is on the line. That's to me very interesting to play. But it was Marcus and the way he sees the world, which is so radically different from my own. I became an actor to work with people like him. Tucker was awesome, but he did not get the role. Marcus believed that his look was not what he was looking for. He has an angel face, you know? He can never be believable as a cynic, you know? He can act like one, but he doesn't look like one. What are we gonna do? I called him back and I said, look, maybe you have to transform yourself. You know, put the sideburns on to look a bit older. Try the glasses that Dreyfus wore in Jaws. And he sent me like this little VHS tape. I went like, he got the role, he got the part. And action. Is that where she was sitting? Month later, he's sitting in a van with Arlie Ermey, and he's holding his own. In fact, Jonathan's idea was that when he gets a gun shoved into his mouth, that he would get so sick to the stomach that he would throw up. You motherfucker! Get the fucking floor! He made himself throw up every time we did the take. And we did 25 takes from different angles just to see him, this young actor, holding his ground was just like one of the best experiences of my life. Mike Vogel's part was what I thought would be the toughest to cast for. His role is that of the guy who always says the wrong thing at the exact wrong time to say it. I guess that's what brains look like. Huh? It's hard to make that guy likable. Sort of like uh, lasagna, kind of. God, he's a schmuck, and nobody's going to care if he ever dies. All right, I'll shut up now. He came in and read it, and I went like, you know, he's a schmuck, he thinks, but I still like him. When you bring an audience in mentally into something and get them to care about the characters, get them to care about what these guys are going through, oh, shit, fuck people would look at this and be like, oh, my word. Erica Learson plays Pepper. Pepper is the free spirit. The movie opens, oh, she's boy, making you're... out with Andy. We didn't even know each other yesterday. Erica goes for it, whatever she's doing when she's acting. To speak to her, she's certainly not effusive. Am I ready? Mm -hmm. I don't feel ready. But when she acts, she totally goes for it. <laughs> Why did she have to be? <laughs> she did acting for Woody Allen, which is always the number one verification. I had to go back and watch the original. When I saw that, it's somebody's fucking teeth, isn't it? OK, this could be really, really scary. <laughs> and that's why I wanted to do it. Erin, find your goddamn boyfriend. It's time to go. Also, she was an incredible screamer. Ah! Oh my god! In the scene we auditioned her, 
is when Aaron is trying to hotwire the car. Come on. It's coming! It's coming! Come on! Marcus, in the middle of the audition, just wanted to get her to scream as loud and as hard as she could. Coming to the roof! We were actually auditioning actors at an office building. People above us and below must have been horrified to hear her screaming. She was screaming so loud. Let me out! 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 And literally, Marcus yells, cut. And she just sits back and starts giggling. You see this actress's level of commitment, and then how quickly she can just turn it off. Look out! Lauren German, a tough role. She is not going to just do the visine. One, two, three. A consummate actress. She wanted to stay in that state even between takes. I just wanted to get done with her because it just seemed like I was torturing this poor thing. When we set up to make this movie, we also knew we had to change characters. We didn't want to make a movie that was basically the exact same movie they made in 1973. One of the easier things to change was the dynamics of the family. In the original film, Leatherface is the monster of the movie, but the entire family forms this sort of composite monster. I thought you was in a hurry. All these characters are the psychopath alter egos. He's a split personality. They're just fragments of that split personality. I thought that was a really interesting notion. What's wrong with you fucking people? This movie should be populated with the kinds of characters that are so marginalized from society and just sort of live this frontier existence. And they should be the kinds of people that are so foreign to anyone who lives in a big city that the moment you see them, you know, your skin starts to crawl. Also, I think there's an element to people who were fans of the original. If we use the exact same characters, they would know what to expect from those characters. You kids shouldn't have messed with that little girl. Let's talk about Arlie. That's none of your goddamn business, faggot! He impressed everybody watching Full Metal Jacket. As soon as he gets on set, Vogel starts quoting Full Metal Jacket, and Lee at first is very reticent to start becoming that character, but after 15 minutes... That name sounds like royalty to me. Are you royalty, Private Thou? They're really neat kids. Do you suck dicks, Private Thou? <laughs> <laughs> we could not find a sheriff for the longest time. And Brad Fuller called me up and says, I think I could get Arlie Ermey. I'm like, book him if you can get him. Protect and serve, that's what we do. It was hard to find an actor who could make it feel creepy and scary and bring all the things to it that Lee brought to it. Well, the sheriff is the number two bad guy in the show. I'm no stranger to bad guys. I play bad guys pretty often. I like to try to tailor make each one of them. Huh. Well, let's get her wrapped up. Arlie Ermey reinvented that role in ways that I couldn't have imagined. Is that bribery? It's a lot of fun to play the bad guy. If you're the star of the show, if you're the good guy, uh, right away you have to make people like you. You have to have a nice, sweet personality. The bad guys don't have to deal with that. Excuse me, you mind getting the fuck out of my way, son? He brought this dimension of whacked out bizarreness. Oh, pretty little thing. When I play a bad guy, I like to play him as bad as I possibly can. All right, give me a hand here, asshole. All the dialogue in that sequence when they're wrapping up the body was all ad lib. Back when I was a young patrolman, I used to love wrapping up these young honeys. We came up with some really fantastically morbid dialogue. Oh, look at that. It's kind of wet down there. What have you boys been doing with this dead body? He pretty much rewrote that whole role. Don't give me any crap, young lady. I'll start at a certain level. Oh, God, I need your help right now. My friend, my Shut friend. Shut up! Gone. Shut up! and I'll evolve take after take. Get the fuck over there! I evolve into evil. The director can stop me at any one of those plateaus that I work to. But the thing is, seldom do that. Please let me stop! Look, you mama, she Don't likes stop. me. I know you're kind. The old woman who runs the roadside gas station is the mother of the family. Doesn't anybody around here care? Marietta came up. She was just fantastic. Something like this comes along, you realize how crazy people are out there. She was the sweetest lady I ever get to meet, but if she turns it on... You best stay out there with them dogs. David Dorfman was a, another found treasure. Here we needed somebody who had great acting capabilities. Somebody who could nail it. My name's Erin. Jediah. 
basically my idea of the great banjo picking kid in Deliverance. Jesse, do you want this? I don't really want Vote it Vote Dorfman for uh -huh. president. Uh -huh. <laughs> he needed to get transformed somehow. We put stuff in his hair and we like put a lot of gook on him. And then we had these really bad teeth, you know, that he would put in his mouth. It all slowly came together, but again, you know, we tried to create a character. Nothing a good old cup of tea won't settle. There is this sickly woman who lives in a trailer who is Leatherface's sister. Everyone around here knows that poor, sweet boy. In trying to base this movie as much as possible on actual crimes, it seems like, you know, there's been an explosion of child abductions in the past five years. That's not your baby. So that sickly woman was a composite of different horrific mothers that we've come to know about. She's mine. When we started to cast, we winded up with two favorites, an older woman and the younger woman. We started to somehow butt heads about this, and when I mentioned it to Michael, Michael in a very Machiavellian way said, put them both in. Oh, my, 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 my. She just adds this kind of Fellini quality to it. The whole family looks like they came out of a, you know, mad circus. Will you cut out that racket? Terrence Evans played Old Monty. He's kind of the man of the house in a sense. He's not the father, he's not the old woman's husband, but they sort of keep him around. He's just this crusty old man. Although it's not explained, you notice that he's missing a pair of legs and, you know, presumably he stepped out of line with Leatherface one day and, you know, it cost him dearly. We certainly didn't have the money like in Forrest Gump where you could digitally remove limbs. So essentially this guy's kneeling on a wheelchair and then we got like these weird suction caps that would look like cut off stumps. I built a special wheelchair for him. The man was 6'5", at least. I'm 6'1", myself, and I built a chair for my own stature, and he showed up. It was quite shocking. I had to modify it a little bit and, and make it fit him, and he was a good sport about the whole thing. Could you just... Uh... Yeah. My fear was an older man, and he has to kneel all day long. I asked him about it. I said, are you aware, you know, you have to kneel a lot? He said his daytime job was, he was laying carpets, so he was on his knees all the time. I said, you get the job. Leatherface is the only character in our movie from the original. He is the primary source of terror. Andrew Bernarski plays Leatherface. TCM fans, right, so we won't let you down. I ran into Michael Bay at a party. It was right after he had announced they were going to do the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And I was like, man, Michael, I got to play Leatherface. I gotta play Leatherface. I was born to wear the mask. <laughs> we started talking, it looked real good, along with Michael's blessing and Marcus, who really had the final say. You gotta be so close that when they close the door, okay, the chainsaw is in here. Originally, I think Michael and me agreed on it, we just said, get us the biggest guy. When we finally winded working with Andrew, I realized that it took much more than just a big guy. Not only just the physical things, but be able to act through the mask as well, through his body motions. Because a lot of it you're not going to be able to see. Because again, he's wearing a mask that doesn't move. And a lot of expression from people comes through facial movements and from speech and everything else. So he has to use his entire body. When you wear this mask, you have to exaggerate. You have to go a little bit kabuki. But it's easy to go too far with that. But if you do too little, it's just boring. Andrew gave us a full range. Anybody watching this knows Gunnar Hansen played Leatherface in the original movie. He defined the role. It was sporadically endearing in the midst of the pathos. That worked very well. Get back in there! In a way, that's what makes him more horrifying than if he were somehow sinister. In our version of the movie, I play Leatherface with much more tenacity. Evil is as evil does. This Leatherface, he knows what he's doing. He likes what he's doing. He's driven by rage and revenge. The extent to which I developed it was that he was a guy forever picked on when he was in school. He developed tumors on his face and his face was being eaten away by cancer. Kids can be extremely cruel, especially when they you know, target an individual who's different. He was just a little boy when it started. Didn't you look at his face? He's just this raging sort of maniac, and yet he's insulated by this family unit. Tommy's going to have a really good time with her. That will go to any length to keep him out of the nut house or, or jail or whatever. Dallas Brown, Hewitt, you get in here right now! 
I personally went out saying we should do it in a snuff film, go back to the visceral appearance of the first one. And Daniel kept on saying, I completely agree. I couldn't agree more. That's exactly what we have to do. And then first day Staley's came back and became very apparent. It's not going to be the snuff movie I had in mind. Marcus is very much a visual image maker. There already is a Marcus look, you know, that goes into us. He's got some very visual commercials, some dark stuff. He likes a high contrast ratio. He likes things to fall off in the shadows. If you have to lean forward a little bit sort of to see what's in the shadows, it brings about a certain involvement of the audience. You're pulled into it a little bit more. <laughs> A lot of movies come out that directors of my background get to do that want the look of a commercial and that want the look of a music video. But what I did before all that is I used to paint. I was a painter and an illustrator and I liked Degas and I like Rembrandt. And horror movies is actually ironically the only place where you can practice that, where you can do that kind of a lighting style that's dark and rich. We all had this vision that he can create this picture of death as beautiful, picking out the beautiful things in those scares. By approaching it in this way, I also found sort of a method. Find the poetry and gruesomeness, find the poetry and decay and the morbid, finding the beauty in something that's actually very dark and strange. The color palette for the whole movie was basically sort of a, a sepia tones and tobacco-y tones. We made a conscious effort to have a lack of color in the settings and in the movie. Marcus very much wanted this whole thing with this color of puke and that the, the colors don't be so vibrant. And they go, I don't want these blue, blue skies and these green, green, greens, you know. When you make a print, normally they bleach out the extra silver to make it this normal negative, which is what we're all used to seeing as some more naturalistic. And in the bleach bypass process, they skip the bleach. The whites go a little bit stronger. The shadows get a little more contrasting, and the colors become very saturated. That's the part we were after. The one bit of color that you would see, of course, would be the blood red. I bet she's real unhappy with us. You're getting fucking her blood all over your goddamn arm. The situation, even though it seems that we had a couple of million dollars more than the original, was devaluing money, it pretty much buys you the same amount of shoot days. And a camera is a camera. The original was a bunch of people who were basically doing it for the first time. The remake was more Hollywood type of production. But at the same time, we weren't large budget. I mean, I had more equipment, I had more manpower, I had more things. But it wasn't like suddenly I was shooting Gone with the Winter or something that had just gotten completely huge. What I liked was there was very little time for prep. It was a few days to have your idea sorted out. I'm going to watch it from here. I want to dolly to work at the same time. David. I'm going to talk to them from here, so doing it, okay? The first meeting that I had with him, my first time I actually got together after he'd taken the movie, he was storyboarding the, the film, the whole house with storyboards everywhere, he'd been drawing the film. Well, my background is, is in storyboarding. I storyboarded the whole movie, and I did my rough drawings in three days, pretty much. I just drew up what I saw. We shot this in Austin, Texas. I sent my location scout, Richard Klotz, he went out there and literally, his first shooting in one week, he just nailed all the locations. Marcus saw the pictures and he's like, oh my God, I couldn't imagine anything better. Texas has the big skies. It has places where time has stood still for years. Oh! Wow. wow! The best part about it is even though it was like hot as hell, there was a water hole pretty much wherever we went. So after a long day of shooting, we just like jumped in the water. actually wound up inspiring one of the scenes that we started the movie off with. That's pretty much how it looked every evening. The great state of Texas, God bless it, is a wonderful location. You ever walk out on a 100-acre Texas cornfield to an old farmhouse on the edge of the woods, you're going to feel, you know, things that you don't want to feel, things that you can't repress. It's a very real fear for no real reason other than the immenseness of the dark in Texas, the sky on the plain. When it gets black, it gets really black. And you always feel like there's something in those woods. We didn't travel much, which was a real saving grace. Even though the movie seemingly takes place in many, many different locations, they were all in the same area. It's part of my philosophy of filmmaking. I don't like to build sets. I hardly ever do, unless it's something very, very specific. The location really affects actors and it affects the acting. If you can make the location work, I'd much rather have that than a set. Bob Burns was the original production designer in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Having been a fan of the original movie, 
we were really afraid to mess it up too much, so we used the original movie as a jumping off point. To me, the scariest image, when Leatherface comes out, he clubs the guy and slams that door. That steel door is iconic. The house also is iconic. Part of the production design was taken from Ed Gein's house. There's a Life magazine article, I believe, that has a lot of pictures that uh, we used as reference. You had fingers and body parts, mutilated body parts, and boxes. Most of the stuff you can't even show. It's as spooky a house as you've ever seen. It couldn't be scarier. This house looks like the Führer bunker, you know, somewhere. It's like, how does it wind up somewhere in Austin, Texas? We barely brought any props to this house because it was so incredible. It had basically all the right settings. You know, it had screen doors that could be backlit beautifully, long hallways that looked a lot like the original old lace on the windows that had become corroded and was deteriorating. And action! Nobody lived in this house for decades. The cobwebs and the mildew and all that is real. The walls in the house had become moldy with this kind of black Texas mold that we actually had to seal into the walls. They did have a specialist come in with the full suits on and kill the mold. So that we could all be in the house and breathe and not get sick. We wound up sealing it in because we wanted to keep the texture that was on it. It looked so great. I mean, it looked like some scenic had come in and done this on purpose. And I don't think we could have done it any better. The outside of the house was as is. We just added a little bit of aging paint. We replaced a few screens and that's about it. It was a real gem, that house. Everything was pretty much shot right there. The look of the kitchen that we tried to go with came a lot from the director. We took some basic bed springs and hung them up in the ceiling. We actually hung real meat there. The kitchen seemed to be a good place to do that. Just like the idea of lowered ceilings, it makes it all sort of claustrophobic. It's sort of like a forest of yicky stuff to go through, and there's all this paraphernalia. There's a lot of stuff we had to lose. I had a lot of great close-ups of roaches and, you know, over the kitchen sink was all the grimy stuff in that kitchen, lots of animals. There's pigs in there, there's chickens, there's, there's flies, there's everything in that kitchen. When they showed me the uh, basement, ah! it was just so incredible, eerie, the smell of it and, you know, how it's covered in layers of dust and cobwebs. It represents sort of this descent into the belly of the beast, so to speak. That's Leatherface's kill room, we'll call it. He had a chain link bed where he would butcher people up and the blood and the guts would drip down through. And his tools that he used, he had various meat cleavers and things that he was well known for, hooks and things that he would sew his mask with. The location was in a town called Martindale and it was an actual cotton gin. Dressing that set was quite the ordeal. The whole place had flooded out, it was under five feet of water. So when the water subsided, we went in there and did our best in the mud and dressed everything, which actually gave the look of it that much more, because now the wood was old, tenderized, dripping water, dripping mud, and it was great. The Crawford Mill was in a town called Wahlberg, and once again, it was another cotton gin that had been abandoned for who knows how many years. A marker. B. B mark. Very little did we have to do to that place. We, we did do a little bit of painting and, and aging. Everything was there that we needed. We brought very few things, maybe a few barrels and boxes and crates and things like that. This chainsaw spot is where? We kept a pretty fast and loose attitude towards shooting. A lot of times, like, oh, well, let's grab this while we can grab it. So while we're at this, with this light, do the people, the fish eye? Or do you have the stuff to do that? You know, sometimes we did, sometimes we didn't. You were just trying to scare me into leaving. We went inside the mill to block the scene off when they open the little closet there. When we scouted out, there is a dead possum lying on the floor. It looked absolutely gross and disgusting. And I said, well, why don't we put a possum in that closet? When Kemper is opening up the closet, this possum will scare the hell out of us. <laughs> they get me a possum on the day of the shoot. We open it up and the possum doesn't do anything. He seemed disinterested. I'm going to the animal wrangler and say, like, what's up with the possum? Why is he not doing what I want him to do? And he says, you know this expression, as dead as a possum? They play dead. That's what they do. Damn it! I asked him to agitate it a little bit, just like played with this sort of possum, but hopefully he want to go for his finger. And then it did, and it like almost took his finger off. <laughs> That's a poor man. Give me something to hold. It's awesome. In the third act of the original Texas Chainsaw, there's this dinner scene where they're consuming flesh. And at the time, I think people were so shocked by what it was, they couldn't believe what they were seeing. What do we have going on the grill? 
we tried to come up with an interesting way to put that scene in the movie, and we simply didn't think that it fit tonally with, with what we were trying to do. I suggested the idea that we play down the cannibal aspect of it, that if it's there, it's implied. It's not on the table, it's not in your face. The threat of cannibalism is definitely beneath the surface of this movie. When he walks into the kitchen with the hanging meat, I mean, those look like uh, thighs to me, if you ask me. Maybe she'd like to stay for supper. We eliminated it, and a good portion of the third act of our film is set in a slaughterhouse, which we felt was a component of the original that bared more investigation because Leatherface is a character who was raised in a slaughterhouse. <laughs> the exterior of the Blair Meat Company actually is a true slaughterhouse. It's the Taylor Meat Company in Taylor, Texas. The inside of the slaughterhouse was interesting. We wanted to create a maze out of meat carcasses. We couldn't afford prop meat. Didn't exist, we would have had to make it, so it's all real meat. They had done a slaughter the day before, and before it was shipped off, they rented it to us, saved us a bundle of money. It was sitting there, it didn't hurt anybody, and the guy could still run his business, and it worked well with everybody. There were two in particular which were enormous. We had asked especially for like the biggest sides of beef that they had. And we would hang them wherever she would run. So every time you see, it's always the same two carcasses. If you see in the movie, they're all wrapped in plastic. If we did that, the meat inspector would let us get away with just renting the meat instead of having to buy it all. Most of the meat that you see in that scene has probably been consumed by people. You want some pig? The trailer became a whole involved conversation. Originally, it was supposed to be just another house. And I went like, well, they went to the Prairie House, they went to the Hewitt House. Let's have something different. You're in something that you think is sort of like a bit of a womb. The tea, the comfort in it. Nobody's going to come through that door. Here are maybe people for the first time that find understanding just to mark what just moments later will be the darkest hour. We initially wanted to use a real trailer for it. It was really just too small to film in, so we decided to build it on stage. The whole kitchen wall is basically tin foil. The whole rest of the trailer is old newspapers. My scenic Gary Wimmer found some, worked his magic on them. We built the whole thing on a gimbal so that when people were in it, it would rock. The trailer was one of our few sets, actually. When we first got the van, it looked nothing like what you see in the movie. It was gold with a white stripe. It had two doors in the back with two little windows. It certainly wasn't a hippie van. At the same time, it had certain elements. You know, some shag carpet and some stuff, some beanbag chairs, along with the mechanics, macho kind of stuff. I just wanted the big clutter in it, make it like a little bit of a home. We had the Mad Magazine poster, which we got clearance to use, the Alfred E. Newman head. Well, Mad Magazine is actually a big personal thing of mine. My first interview in America, when I arrived here, on a Fulbright scholarship, no less, my highest aspiration was to work for Mad Magazine. <laughs> And a lot of movies, when I was a kid, I only knew through Mad Magazine because I wasn't allowed to watch it at the movies. I never saw The Exorcist. I only knew the Mad Magazine version of it. Perfect. All right. How was it look? I believe the term Leatherface came from when human skin is pulled off of a cadaver and laid out, it dries up like, like leather. It's basically the same thing as a hide from an animal. Takes dying. There's a guy I worked with, Scott Stoddard, on Pearl Harbor. And I just saw some of the great stuff he did, and I said, listen, do you want a chance to be in charge of this whole movie and create the mask? And he's like, yeah. I had gotten some tapes on Jeffrey Dahmer, a lot of the biography stuff on serial killers. And also I had a lot of crime lab scene photographs. And he would tell me how they actually do it. I said, Scott, I don't actually want to know that. <laughs> For Leatherface, I saw him more as like a taxidermist. But it was in a childlike way as well. He saw things he liked and he put them together in ways that could work on him. But it was done very crudely. I started going through designs, putting the piece of a woman's mouth and nose down on the neck. Items that didn't make sense, but you knew that it was something that he really admired or enjoyed or liked about a certain person. It was also to mask, so you didn't see an exact replica of who the, th who the person is underneath it. Leatherface doesn't have a personality, and that's why he's wearing other people's faces. The Latin word for mask is persona. Personality is a mask. So for a lot of early designs, then I was weighing out like how old the skins are. Some of them are really dried up and he's held on to them for a long time, doesn't want to get rid of them. Other ones are a little fresher, maybe a month old or something. So there's weight and moisture to them. So some of the forms would kind of be all bizarre and falling off of his face. 
Stoddard started to show me original drawings, and I went, well, he looks like a Frankenstein guy, and he looks like a monster. It wasn't until he presented me with a little three-dimensional depiction that I really liked it. And that's why this little scene where he took his mask off became very, very important for me. We took the nose off, and that told us a lot about the reason why he wears a mask, but we saw that there's actually a real person under it. He didn't come to Earth on a UFO. It only looks a certain way until you put it on someone. When you put it on someone, they bring it to life. I saw some pictures that they took in the mask where I was just like, I looked like Satan. I felt like I could scare people very effectively in that mask. Hi, I'm your infamous villain. We had done um, initially a makeup on his face where his eyes and his lips and his mouth would be exposed. Marcus has a choice to either have his eyes closed so you can't see anything, it's like hollow sockets, or you get his eyes, because his eyes are really bright blue, so they can stream out of it. These are Andrew's leather faced teeth. This is made from a dental cast of his mouth. The teeth are sculpted on top, so on the inside, this is an exact duplication of his teeth. So they fit him just like a glove. <laughs> and then done like a diseased sword makeup. A lot of open sores and little pus balls and just really chapped up lips. Scott, I love being in your capable hands. I do that in the morning and he can go and do whatever he needed to do. When we would get ready to shoot the scenes, that's when I would put the masks on him. And the masks were just slipped over his head. They conformed to his face so they fit his face just right. And we would just strap them up the back. Comb his hair, make sure it looks right, and he was good. <laughs> The Balfour mask is just terrifying. It just gives everybody a time to go, ah! Now, Scotty and I did a life cast of Eric Balfour. He came in and we put an, what's called alginate on his face and actually got a, a perfect duplication of his face. And we uh, made that into a silicone version of him. Do some stitching here and here, rip the eyelid a little bit. Throw some blood on him and you know, kind of wet it down, give it that moist look. Eric was freaked out. Watch me on HBO. Are you good? Six feet under. The silicone mask was definitely the hardest thing to work in. The silicone doesn't breathe at all and has horrible visibility. There's a scene on top of the van where I have that mask and it's very limited visibility and I have to jump off the van with a 35 pound chainsaw. And that was one of the scarier moments. This is the chainsaw movies. We needed to make sure that it was right. The chainsaw itself, we basically wanted to be true to the original one. We looked for chainsaws that were period. We looked at the different sizes of blades. We ended up buying new chainsaws, scenicing them to look as if they were from the period. We probably had approximately 10 chainsaws throughout the whole thing. Like Tiger Woods you know, has his clubs. One of my main decisions on every given shoot day would be, well, I guess we take the rubber one that spouts smoke, and then for the next take, we take the real one without the teeth. Most of the time, he did have a real running chainsaw without the chain spinning. We modified it so it would smoke or it would spark, or whatever it needed to do at that point. Very heavy. It literally weighs about 35 pounds. It produces a massive amount of smoke, although it makes it challenging to work around. That's only because full blast chainsaw trigger is the only way to go when you're chasing somebody and you want to be scary. We had a work chainsaw, and by work I mean fake. You can pose for pictures with that, but you can't cut through trees, cut through walls, cut through legs. And those are real chainsaws, make no mistake about it. We also had the chainsaws that we used, bicycle chain. A bicycle chain will look like a chainsaw when it's moving, and it won't uh, be as dangerous. So, Marcus, I have a real chainsaw here with no blade on it. But nobody can be hurt, right? Nobody's going to be hurt. That's what I want. The guy wanted to, to work his own chainsaw. The saw is family. Where is my saw? I had to become one with it. I had to learn how to make it my friend because I am Leatherface. Leatherface's best friend is this chainsaw, and that has to really come through. That Leatherface knows his saw. Ah! Ah! 
cut, we got this. Cut! What I did really early in this process was I wanted to pull myself out as a director who gives micromanaging directions. He says, I want exactly like that, and I've seen this, and I want it to look like on this reference. I just try to fertilize everybody's minds and then just see what grows on all that stuff. Good. This is just about you guys in the car, she just speaking the yeah. line. Yeah. Marcus is incredibly passionate about everything, which really makes my job easy because he cares so much about what my opinion is, whether it be dialogue, whether it be the action of the scene. He just cares about what we think. Can I go down to the bottom, like to the floor? Yes. And maybe even just go like, Yeah, pull him in. Yeah. He's pulling out. The beat. Tell because the kid to refuse he's her, okay? Like he doesn't he's want to go. Kind of looking at me like, right. Yeah. I treasure that. And action. I wanted to try to create a situation where they really get to respond, be in real location, have real physical experiences, where they get to react rather than act. Got it? Again. Nothing changes. Okay, we'll right away again. Right away again. Well, Marcus again. always wants to be shooting. He always wants to be moving. Always wants to be shooting. Always wants everybody to be on point, on job, and I respect that a great deal. Pay attention. I only do this once. No, and he's not belittling. And he's not degrading, but he wants to make sure that everybody's prepared and ready for the day and ready for the scene at all times. Where's Andy? Excuse yes, sir. And if they're not ready, he calls him on it. Come, nobody listens to me. See, there it is. Quick, get him. Get him. I don't know. Get him. What is this, American bullshit? We shoot. Shoot. <laughs> there are Marcusisms. We shoot. We get fucked up now. We shoot now. Shoot. Shoot. We must shoot. But Marcus, the actors aren't here. I don't give a fuck. I shoot around them. We should have shot 10 minutes ago, five minutes ago. Shoot, shoot. <laughs> okay, roll everything. We must continue. I'm not angry with you. It's just me. I what are you an idiot? idiot? I'm German, and this is the way I express myself. That is my German way of saying, please do better. As he's yelling at everybody. Let's get shoot. control on these people. <laughs> I really like lively shoots. I think it works for the actors, and I think it works for the crew. He has theories that our DP is plotting against him. Daniel, what are you doing? Uh, I'm I don't know the phrase. I'm sorry. I guess I screwed it up. Daniel Pearl has always has these schemes apart from Marcus to get the lighting he wants in the shot. Okay, set. Turn a little bit this way. And action. He'll tell Marcus, yeah, yeah, you know, I need I need one more minute, boss. I need, I need one minute. No. 12 by And Marcus knows all his they've been shooting together for years now, so he knows he's always Pearl, is this another one of your schemes? What am I waiting for? Right, don't mess with that, please. I gotta get this light. Let's go, let's go, let's go. I need, who's he looking at? We leave them alone. They have a special relationship. They're sort of like the, the good and evil twins. They kind of look alike. They hash it out, you know, and they get through it. I mean, anything goes as long as it's in your favorite light position. It's fun. It's, you, you feel like you're, you're waging a battle with him. Action! This is like a guerrilla war. <laughs> this is a type of movie where you shoot first and ask questions later. We had to really, really rock. This is good for her if that's a meeting point, right? When he's out, she's here. There's a certain control chaos. It's a little bit more intense than the normal commercial routine because we're here for 40 days as opposed to three to six or eight. And that's a good. It was tough. We all worked really, really hard on it. Action! Days that go 15 hours plus in the hot Texas sun. Action! Tensions were high a lot of the time. Arguments ensue and tempers flare. Rolling! Action! He sees things before they happen and knows what he wants to happen immediately, sometimes faster than people's hands can actually move. We didn't shoot fast enough for Marcus. You know where we are. And he got pissed off and started hitting me in the head. I didn't think it was my fault. But it's really fun to work with him because you never are bored. You never actually take a breath or eat or stop either. But that's fine. Yeah, fantastic. Good. Good. Thanks. We've thrown our hearts and souls into this. Interesting enough, Can Do Jessica is a vegetarian. <laughs> she told me she would have an easier time if there would be dead humans hanging around than dead animals. She came to us the night before and she said, you know, I don't eat meat. I'm not going to love this but I'm gonna do it. And that was the last complaint we heard. None of us knew she was gonna be hiding in the middle of a carcass. It was like 32 degrees in there, and she's getting right in the middle of that carcass, and if you look closely, you can see the heart and the intestines of the thing. She didn't complain once. The biggest challenge, I think, was for her to scream. Her voice caves in after like a few loud screams. The 
the good thing is we shot the movie in sequence, so as her voice gets more and more screwed up as we go into the schedule, at least it's sequential. Scream it out! Scream it out! Scream it out! Scream it out! Everyone knew that we were trying to make a movie about a movie that we loved. I live for this shit. And so people were willing to go that extra mile for us. <laughs> We had to have a meat hook in the movie. Yeah. That's you right. can't make the Texas Chainsaw without having someone on a meat hook. We actually took a real meat hook and we cut the end off of it. We call it a blunt end. And then when we cut to it the other way, and we took this real hook and put a dummy on that, we insert a real hook into a slot that has a metal protector between him and his skin to give it a realistic look. Bring up your arms and drop out! For that sequence, we had to put him in a harness. And the harness kind of went around his thighs and his butt kind of around his waist and really dug into him. He was in a tremendous amount of pain when we were shooting the sequence. We offered to take him down off the harness a couple times, and he said to us, if you take me down, I'm never going to make it back up. Oh. He was on that thing for five hours. Oh. Oh. I can't imagine the pain that he was in. Ah. Andrew is a very visceral actor. If it's up to him, it's all a real chainsaw, and he'd really stab him. <laughs> He's a little terrifying. I'm not quite sure about him. Oh, no! I'm hanging there on the hook, staring down at him, and he's just looking at me through this mask. It was tripping me out. There was one scene where he's supposed to be cutting my shirt off my back, and he's like grunting and moaning, jabbing me and stabbing me in the back, and I'm like hunched over dead and going, Andrew, you're cutting me, you're cutting me. And he was literally like cutting into my back and stuff and didn't care, but he's gonna snap. In my opinion, is this the kind of thing to do method? Absolutely not. There's a scene where I take Jessica Beale and I've got her with her hair wrapped around my hand. I start to drag her and I see Morgan and it stops me in my tracks and I have to make a decision. What am I going to do? I got this girl by the hair that I'm about to kill and then I got her friend over there that are now I'm going to have to kill him maybe first. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use my little finger, which is all behind your hair. When I scratch your head, you throw yourself. Oh, it's brutal. And I would have never been able to do that. I would have never been able to get that kind of cooperation if I had detached so much. Ready, money? Stand by. One step this way. The character is real clear to me, you know, and the motivation is real clear to me. And then the job at hand is also more important to me than playing fantasy around the set. Then I scare them as a human being, and I'm not scaring them as Leatherface. It's all in the job. I want a day's work. Here we go, into the fray. Okay, we're gonna enter puking stage again. Okay, Mike's gonna puke. We have a lot of fun. <laughs> you all right, Andy? <laughs> sure, please. You hear stories from a lot of people about everyone goes to work and goes home and, and they're really alienated. We've had a chance as a cast to really bond and make real relationships on and off the set. You're rough on my back. Yeah, okay, so what, you like a little smoother like that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Everyone has gelled. I mean, every night we're hanging out. Hey, Beth, where's she's been? I saw it. I saw it. Check the van out. Come on, look. Van's good. It's good. Oh, yeah. Oh, we don't, we don't fuck around. Good. It looks good. I think it's going to carry on that way after even we're done shooting. Yo, oh. shut this out right here, ready? We felt very strongly that in order for these characters to care about each other and for that to show up on screen, that they had to have a relationship with one another. Boom! Cut! Lovely. Boom is right. That's how you no. describe that shot. Boom, 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 boom. Everyone's kind of annoying, so I just like to do my stuff and like go back to my trailer. <laughs> Working with Jessica has been a nightmare. Never easy, never cool. Eric smells. He doesn't shower. <laughs> And he doesn't use soap, so his pits really stink. I don't want any set moms around me. We have so much fun just being knuckleheads. My neck is killing me. And Erica's really scared about spiders. I can't even put a spider on. She freaks out. <laughs> now, there were spiders everywhere. Tons of spiders. Big, hand-sized banana spider. And she got so screamy with it that everybody got into this like frantic state of mind because her scream was just like, <laughs> She certainly has insect issues. My name is Jonathan Tucker. That is Herr Vogel. Tucker, 
Careful, bro. Mike Bogle was my best friend from LA. He's dead He's right now. He's a male now. model. You three boys. <laughs> Give me, put your hands up and show the male model pose. Mike and I have such a wonderful rapport together. Marcus wanted a real contrasting style. So he wanted the pretty boy. So we hired know, Jonathan actor. Tucker. So they hired and he went Mike with the Bogle. more character type. And then they with the character type, mm -hmm. Jonathan Tucker. We've been doing the same exact banter and laughing for a year. Balfour took his pants off. Oh my god. Eric Balfour grew up in Esalen, which is this commune in Big Sur. Eden type moment. It was very cool yeah. when you saw it in that light, you know. It's during the day and you see the old fat people and you're kind of like, yeah, oh. right, right. Hey guys, guys, listen up. And then the last day of shooting, we wrapped him. Let's give it up for them. <laughs> I don't think anyone had any idea what he was up to. Everybody, thank you. You all were fucking amazing, very much. Thank you guys so much for an amazing experience. You all can take your wardrobe. Oh no, here we go. <laughs> oh no, come on, oh, no. get this one. Oh, no. Shut it. <laughs> Buck naked and walked off the set into the darkness. Certainly the most memorable exit off the set I've ever seen. Harry Knowles showed up. Harry Knowles is somewhat an enigma in Hollywood. He previews movies before they were already done. He has sources. So Harry Knowles shows up and everybody goes into this state of shock. No script can lie around. We can't show Leatherface. I approached him and I said, look, I want to be the first director who has your head on a silver platter. I described to him what I wanted to do. We needed like corpses, severed heads lying around somewhere in Leatherface's basement. He was into it. So we did a cutaway where we put his head on a silver platter. Oh my God. What I always like to think of with special effects, it should be 90% real and 10% enhanced. The minute you enter the visual effect world, audiences today will smell that out. I just saw something. Sometimes a small budget becomes mother of invention there. You look at it and make it a virtue. Oh, oh shit. From the very first meeting I had with Marcus, he had designed the shot already. It was always in my head. It was one of these shots that I felt if I ever get to shoot somebody in a movie, I want to try and see how that looks like. And Marcus was saying, I want to have the camera go from the front dashboard past everybody through the opening in her head and out the back of the van all in one shot. OK, well, we're going to do this in computer a bit later on as well. No, right there, practical. She had the gun placed in her mouth with the air nozzle faced on the other side of it. So when shot from the other side, you would never see the air nozzle. She let me blow a tube of air in her mouth, which expanded her cheeks and jowls out tremendously. And it looked like she really put the gun in her mouth and blew the back of her head off. Our special effects guy, Rocky, was in the back, and he had a special gun called a Trendle gun that shoots tomato soup, noodles, all kinds of things out the back of her head, more like a squib, and it would also bust the back window, and everything came together just right. Greg Nicotero at K&B had created a body of Lauren German. She's hot, isn't she? Marcus, I can introduce you. We had an endoscopic lens, which you usually use for uh, anal examinations. About the size around of a, of a silver dollar. But it's good for the rectum, it's good for the dummy. We had a donut sized hole cut into the dummy's cranium. The prosthetic dummy, we had to place on a dolly. And as the camera tracked back, the dummy tracked back with the camera. And then as it pulled out of the head, Stoddard rigged it so that it would snap back. We didn't think we were going to get it. We sat there trying to do it, and we all looked at each other like, this is crazy. He's nuts. We're never going to get this. But we just went over it a few times, and it became like a dance. Oh, oh my god. god. I oh, love baby. you all. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Baby. The crane arm itself is physically outside the van, but it's on a drop-down bracket that the camera's riding inside the van. But that bracket had to pass through the roof. We cut a slot from the front of the van to the back of the van so that the crane could pass through the whole thing. People at Asylum put the part of the roof back that's not actually there at the time, and they put the glass in the rear window with it complete with its reflections. Archers and action! Mike Vogel gets his leg chainsawed off at the knee. We made a prosthetic leg with a couple dowels that would go down the middle of the leg, representing bone. And I put six blood-filling condoms wrapped around the uh, dowel. It's like layers on layers. You got layers, skin, you get fat cells. 
your tendons loosely balanced and we'll throw some bone. I stood three feet back while an operator I actually used a real chainsaw to go through that leg. Okay, here's our hero baby leg that's beautifully done. One shot. <laughs> Boy, if it didn't look good. I'd like to give you the prize. Thank you very much, huh? Jonathan Tucker goes away in a bad way, getting split up from his crotch up. We created a couple legs to represent Jonathan Tucker. And it was basically puppeteered each leg to be pulled apart as the saw went through. And as the saw went through, Grady was on top with a five gallon bucket full of blood, entrails. We went to the store and bought a whole bunch of real, like, the stomach linings and whatever. And it was mixed into a pail with our fake blood. We poured like two gallons down as the chainsaw went up. Mark was like, that's great, we need more, we need more. Put, I, I want like more, there's a lot of stuff just falling. So we're like, okay, Grady, fill it. We would recycle it because it would land in a plastic bag cut in the floor. And it was just disgusting. We watched it, we're like, this is never gonna be seen. The shot that I actually think is missing is his face spazzing. You know, he's being cut, but he doesn't scream really. I'm not sure if people completely get what's going on. Marcus, I must say, he, he always wanted more graphic. You don't want to lose the audience. You know, you want to show them just enough. After going for a shoot like that, you go numb towards violence. Things that are completely gruesome just strike you as normal. Glenn Scantlebury was my big buddy and editor. He really protected me from going too over the top. You gotta bounce things off from somebody. You get very indulgent. I love that sign, I love that light. I, I, I can't cut this out. But if it's not helping your story, get rid of it. In a horror movie, sound is everything, especially when you can't see. It's always more scary to hear what's behind the door. Doing horror movies, the background sounds have to be something that plays a little bit more important role here because it's creating a mood. The sound in the original movie was a tuning fork that was dragged across a piano string. Just one of those sounds that work. You would think you could have access to a library of chainsaw sounds, but no, we had to go out and record almost every scene with the chainsaw. Just listening to the chainsaw is terrifying. <laughs> Having him chase around and dismember people is just kind of the icing on the cake. We experimented many times with different pitches of chainsaw. We would accompany the chainsaw with sounds of a bear growling or a lion growling. If you took it away, you're left with just the chainsaw. When you put it in, you now have something that gives you a really creepy feeling. I use the analogy of the human body, and the dialogue is like the skeleton, that everything else fits around and upon. Sound effects is like the muscle and the tissue in the human body that create the oomph, that give it some energy. And the music is like the skin that holds it all together, that surrounds it all, that makes it feel like it's one complete entity. Oh my God. For the music, we didn't want the catchy tune. We wanted sort of just like a gloomy underscoring. Steve is someone I've worked with on Pearl Harbor. He's got a really interesting take on things because he kind of sound designs his musical stuff to helps it make it creepier. Most people look at the original as having no score really to speak of. The score is basically sound design, which I think is why it works so well, which is why my job was a little intimidating. The style these days is kind of electronic. I try not to be too modern with it. Leatherface has a theme that you hear at the very beginning. Played on low, low strings for a sort of dirty, dreary effect. Gives it a kind of an ethereal quality, takes you into the film to get it in the audience's mind. So that as the film goes on, it would trigger to them when, when he appears. You're so dead you don't even know it.
There are emotional spots in the film where thematically we did want to do something. I did it for us. I did it so we could start a life. Because Kemper, the boyfriend, doesn't have much time on screen before he gets it, they did need sort of a theme to connect them. Come on. Get in. And then later on, when Kemper is hinted at again in another grisly way, that theme could help the audience feel something for the character that they didn't really get to know because he died so quickly. I wanted the audience to feel the loss. Oh my God. The mercy killing, as we called it. It was the moment where I felt I could really be orchestral. Do it! <laughs> the music plays her emotions building their conflict in her mind of I don't want to, but I have to. The music says what she's doing. She has no choice. I was a bit naive in regards to the ratings board because there are more gruesome movies that I've seen that have gotten their approval. The ratings board is actually more amicable towards showing violence as it occurred in true historic events. But if it is for gratuitous entertainment reasons, as it would be in a horror movie, they don't take too kindly to that. Ironically enough, they wouldn't let us air the trailer that was all black. And I'm like, well, you can't see anything, but well, it's indicated. What I was more concerned about was where New Line would draw the line. Our relationship was collaborative. Mark. We looked at several cuts of the film over a period of time, gave notes to the filmmakers, which were respectfully reviewed and in many cases accepted. One of the few things that New Line urged me to do is to stay away from what they called squishy. See, that's where sound makes things more visceral. In this movie, dry was all right, squishy is not. The difference between dry and squishy is $20 million at the box office. All in all, it was a very positive uh, and satisfactory process. We didn't want the typical kids on the poster. The face, to me, made it more classy. It just showed that the darkness of it and that anything can happen that is somewhat sophisticated how it was laid out. The opposite from the Tales of the Crypt kind of like oozing type face. We did not want this movie to be marketed like a slasher film. This movie is truly about terror. <laughs> the trailer is more about the sense of dread that you feel for these characters than it is who's in the movie. The trailer got very well received. I had a lot of studio presidents call me up and say, wow, that is an amazing trailer. Seriously, I don't even know what the fuck I just saw. It was horrifying, <laughs> completely horrifying. It was so crazy. <laughs> Aristotle believed that the function of tragedy was to dramatize violence as a means of purging fear in the spectator. When all hell broke loose, I was like screaming like a big girl. <laughs> I was sitting there like this the entire time. <laughs> One of the best fucking horror movies I've seen in years. And I've been a die-hard fan of the original. I also think when people see horror films and movies like this, when they're done and they've been scared, and they walk out of the theater and they're talking about it, I think they also say, wow, we don't have it that bad. You made me go back. I won't go back. I look forward to see people jumping out of their seats right in front of me. Ah! There's a certain joy in that.